Welcome to our weekly Bible study here at Holy Family Catholic Church. We're excited to have Vincent back with us this evening. Yay, welcome back, Vincent. We're also celebrating Terry Ann's birthday this evening, so congratulations, Terry Ann. All sorts of celebrations here at Holy Family. We'll begin this evening with our prayer before reading the Word, which is on page 124. For those who are following us along on Facebook Live, we use this resource at Home with the Word, 2021, page 124. Together we pray. In humility and service, O God, your Son came among us to form a community of disciples who have one Father in heaven and one teacher, the Messiah. Let your Spirit make our hearts docile to the challenge of your word, and let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This Sunday, we're on the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time, October the 10th. The 28th Sunday, how many Sundays in Ordinary Time are there? 33. 33. So we're in the home stretch. This is the sixth last Sunday of Ordinary Time. We can guess where the gospel comes from on Sunday because we're in the year of Mark, so the gospel is going to come from Mark for the rest of the year. We've been reading the second reading from the letter to the Hebrews. We remember the letter to the Hebrews is a pseudonymous work, meaning we don't know who wrote it. For many years we attributed it to St. Paul, but now we look at it and say, no, this is a different language, a different vocabulary, a different style of writing. This can't be St. Paul. And then the first reading... It's from the Book of Wisdom, so we have part of the, the wisdom literature of the Bible. The first reading. Would like to proclaim the first reading for us? Jenny, go for it. <coughs> loud, loud voice. Reading one, wisdom. A praise and prudence was given me. I pleaded, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred her to scepter and throne, and deemed riches nothing in comparison with her. Nor did I liken any priceless gem to her, because all gold in view of her is a little sand, and before <clears throat> her silver is to be accounted mild. Beyond health and, com and comeliness, I loved her, and I chose to have her rather than the light, because the splendor of her never yields to sleep. Yet all good things come together came Come to me in her company, and countless riches at her hand. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. As we go through our readings this evening, let's ask ourselves three questions. What words and phrases stand out as we hear these scriptures? As we hear these words from wisdom, what words and phrases stand out to you? Number two, through these words, what is God calling you to? Ooh, isn't that a good question when we read the Bible? Okay, these words written years ago, millennia ago, what do these words mean to you today? And number three, what is God calling us to as a result of that? It's ultimately the task of preaching when someone stands up and breaks open the word of God. They're trying to help us understand what it is that God might be calling us to through any set of scriptures. Any words that jump out at us, Vincent? Well, I'm trying to figure out who is her. Who is her? But you see it uh, at least, well, I was seeing it, but uh, one, two, <coughs> three, maybe four times. Uh huh. And I see her. Who is her? Who is she? Who is she? Yes. Excellent question. So, unfortunately, in English, we have a language in English that doesn't have gender. Think about it, though. When we learn Spanish, everything is, at, is either male or female. El sol, la luna. The sun is masculine, the, loon is, the, the moon is feminine. In this case, in Spanish, the word that we would have is la sabiduría, so there wouldn't be any doubt about who she is. In English, la sabiduría, wisdom. So how beautiful that wisdom is personified in feminine terms. Wisdom is a feminine attribute of God. Hmm. So 
So women are smarter than men? <laughs> so women are smarter than men? <laughs> yes, there's something about, the, the question becomes, for the ancients, why did they picture wisdom being feminine? That's an excellent question. It makes you wonder. It's theology. For us, <laughs> for us, it's, it's a tremendous thing because we're so used, when we see pronouns, we're used to seeing, for instance, God's pronouns as something other than, do you, are you familiar with pronouns these days? People like will begin by introducing themselves with their, with their pronouns. And say, my name is Father Jamie. My pronouns are he, him, his. Right? God's pronouns, if God were to introduce God's self, God would say, hello, my name is God, and my pronouns are God, God, gods. Follow me? Because God doesn't have gender in the same way that we have gender. So God wouldn't say, my pronouns are he, him, hers, he, he, him, his, or she, her, hers, or they, their, theirs. God would say, my, pro my pronouns are God, God, gods. Which is why you don't hear me refer to God's people as his people, because they're as much her people as his people, which is why we just say they're God's people, Stephen. So why do we pray that our father? Isn't father for a man or? Father is definitely a man. So why do we pray our father? Like Excellent that? question, because had Jesus 2,000 years ago, instead of saying our father, had he said our mother who art in heaven, then today we'd be praying our mother. Hmm. Presuming two things. One, that Jesus didn't live in a patriarchal society. So the words that we often use here, androcentric, what does androcentric mean? Male-centered. Male-centered, centered on males. Or the other word that we often hear is patriarchal. Patriarchal is how it is that all of these male-centered values are made part of the systems that we find ourselves in. The challenge is that Jesus lived in an androcentric and patriarchal world. So when he prayed, boy, that would, have, that would have rattled some cages had Jesus prayed our mother in heaven. It would rattle a few cages today. Imagine how many more 2,000 years ago. So for Jesus to picture them in male language, two things would, would have been necessary. One, for Jesus to have said that, and two, for the society to have accepted that rather than just calling him crazy out of his mind. And so obviously, when, it, when people put words like this into Jesus' mouth, I say that because we remember that there were four people who wrote stories about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. They all write different stories about Jesus, but there is some consensus with Matthew and Luke who have the story of the Our Father. They're the only two who have the Our Father as a prayer. They, they have Jesus. They say that Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, and as a result of them having written that down today, 2,000 years later, we pray, our Father who art in heaven. All the while knowing that 2,000 years later, we don't see God in the same way, but we understand that 2,000 years ago, there were various people who said that Jesus pictured God with the same intimacy of a child picturing his or her father. Thank you. No, I was just, you know, but, but you said it, you know, assuming that's what Jesus said. We're just going by according to Matthew and This is all we have. We don't have any recordings. We don't have any recordings that exist of Jesus on the mountainside. So possibly he could have said our mother. That is a fascinating <laughs> thing. And that's where feminist liberation theology comes into all of this because after two thousand years of seeing the scriptures interpreted through androcentric and patriarchal lenses, we have various people in the churches, especially our sisters, and this is why we love the contribution of women in the church, because they are asking questions like that and saying, wait a minute, just because Matthew has the, a story of Jesus saying, our father, couldn't, there have, couldn't it be possible that Jesus said, our father, mother, or whatever other words, and definitely, that's a possibility. But Matthew did not record that for whatever reason. Imagine how radical that would be. In many feminist interpretations, then, they're sort of taking what it is that we've received from sources like this and trying to imagine it through the eyes and the ears of women. Imagine being a woman living 2,000 years ago, or anyone living 2,000 years ago, hearing Jesus. Is this really what Jesus said, or is this simply because these poor guys lived in the middle of a certain society? Imagine if you actually did hear Jesus, what he might have said, and how similar to or different from these words that might have been. That's it. 
Next question. Going on, buddy. Based on Becky. What if was that prayer said just when he was at the mountaintop, or was that an everyday prayer when they gathered together and said, "Be our Father"? And how was it? And who was the one that interpreted? He said the prayer. Was it the beloved? That's an excellent question. So, all that we have with respect to that prayer are these four stories, these four gospels, and so our challenge becomes. You know, finding everything that we can in those Gospels that will help us to understand that. What we understand is that, that Matthew and Luke have Jesus presenting it as a, as a model for prayer. When you pray, say, Our Father in Heaven, holy is your name. Did he do that every day? We don't have, the Bible doesn't go so far as to say that he said the Our Father every day. But what we do have in the Gospels is him presenting it as a model for prayer. When you do pray, here's a model of prayer for you. Why was the Our Father so important? Because rather than imagining God in some cloud light years away, suddenly Jesus was teaching us about an imminent God. There are two ways of picturing God. The two fancy words that we use in theology are as a transcendent God. What is a transcendent God? Up in the clouds, far away, light years, universes away. That's a transcendent God. Jesus did not have a transcendent God. Jesus' God was an imminent God. What does that mean? God is close to us, intimate. And so when you pray, you're not praying to some being off on a cloud or a mountain somewhere. You're praying in the same way that you talk to your Father. And what's fascinating about that, that, that word, our Father, Abba, would actually translate into uh, a word that a child would call his or her dad. And of course, children don't say, Father. Children say, Poppy, or Daddy, or Dad, which is what Abba would mean. When you pray to God, use that type of language. Daddy, Mommy, Poppy. <coughs> uh, you know, talking about evolution uh -huh. in our science classes, we debated that. Had to be a woman to reproduce, and she's the only one that has the perfect body, but she can have a child. And uh, uh, it was a huge debate. You know, some people are religious and say, "No, God made them." Yeah. Uh, so evolution was more like. I'm picking up what you're putting down. So. Now, Father Darmid Omar Kuh, a Roman Catholic priest in Ireland, says, if you look back in, in archaeology, archaeologists will tell you, before we believed that God was a man, we believed that God was a woman. Our ancient ancestors had this insight. Someone created this world. Who created this world? If there was a being that created this world that somehow resembled us as human beings, that being was not a male, because males don't bring anything into this world. It's women who do. So the most ancient images of God that we have are of a woman or of female creatures giving birth to this world. That is a radical reclaiming of an ancient tradition that has been squashed by 2,000 plus years of patriarchy and androcentrism. Mario? We were talking about a cell. The first thing was a cell that had to happen in evolution. It's not a religion, but in evolution. It had to be a cell that evolved and was able to produce more, more, more cells. Yeah. And uh, it had to be a female. That, I mean, some of the girls were there. Yeah. It had to be. There you go. It had to be a woman because uh, you all cannot re reproduce. Yeah. What I'm hearing is that there's some insight then, rather than, rather than thinking of God in these masculine terms of Abba, Daddy, Father, etc., there's something about this Sunday's first reading that takes a look at a feminine aspect of God that we can look to instead. So when people say, no, God's pronouns are not God, God, God's, it's him and he. God is a him. Well, explain this then. La sabiduría. Peggy? So this Sunday, when you fix the readings up, will you say, um, 
I pleaded in the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred wisdom to scepter and throne. Are you going to change all the hers to the word wisdom? That is an excellent question. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but that's an excellent question only because you're, you're sensing a pattern here. Anytime had that word been his, I would have changed it only because of all of these centuries of, of swinging us in this one direction of him, 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 his, his, he, when we're talking about God. So the question becomes, how do we reclaim this other tradition and help people to realize that God is just as much her and she as him and he? God, God, gods are God's pronouns. The book that I'm publishing next week talks about God's pronouns. It says, you know, we just... It takes a look at all of the Sundays for the next year and says, anytime you see the word he or him or his in this reading, use God's pronouns instead. I'd love to encourage and challenge us in this room. Every time we're proclaiming scripture, as Janie just did, anytime we come to a pronoun that's not one of God's pronouns, we're referring to God, use one of God's pronouns. Respect God. God is not a male. It's tough, Father, because whenever I'm praying... And I've gotten to where I'm a little more comfortable with God when I'm praying. Yeah. A little more conversational as opposed to, like, praying. Yeah. And whenever I'm, like, just, like, hanging out, just talking to him, it's like, I, Father God, like, Father God. And it's just a habit. But I've noticed myself here in recent weeks, like, trying to really break that habit. But even this morning, I was talking to him, and I was see? I just did it again, and I didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> it's tough. I, I'm trying to break myself of that. But I understand that God doesn't have a sex. It's just I was raised. You were raised, and many of us were raised in that way. It's sort of like we're programmed. <coughs> we're in mind as, 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 uh, as computer software, we're programmed to think of God in a certain way. That comes to us from our culture and from other voices around us. The first a few times you referred to God, though, you used God's pronouns, right? When I was praying to God, <coughs> and so the challenge becomes, how do we rewire ourselves after we're wired to think a certain way? Change is difficult. Sorry, Anne? <laughs> Processing. <laughs> Any other words and phrases that stand out for us as we see this first reading? Riches, priceless. Riches, priceless. Gold, silver. Gold and silver. Why are those words important? Because I prayed, and what did I ask for? Did I ask for gold, gold and silver and riches, things that are precious? No. What I asked for was first line. I prayed for prudence. prudence. Second line, I prayed for wisdom. You see that? When I prayed, I could have asked for anything, like Solomon. Remember the story of Solomon? God said, I'll, I'll give you anything you want. What did Solomon ask for? Wisdom. If God comes to you tonight and asks, hey, I'll give you anything you want, what would you want? Ooh, give me a million dollars. The author of the first reading this Sunday says, what did I pray for? I prayed for prudence and for wisdom. Prudence almost synonymous with wisdom. Prudence is like uh, when you're tempted to say something, but you don't. Or tempted not to say something, but you do. Prudence is that wisdom of, of knowing what to say and do in any situation. Any other words or phrases that stand out for us from Sunday's first reading? Question number two. Through these words, what is God calling you to do? If God were speaking to you through these words, what would God be saying to you? What do you have to do this week to make you a different person from last week? Prefer God to the scepter and throne. <clears throat> One word. God is calling us to prefer God over others. Joe? The word love is the word. Okay. Nothing else counts. God is calling us to love. Go deeper. What is God calling us to love? In this reading, is God calling us, is it talking about other people? It's talking about loving God, loving wisdom. More than riches. Ooh, think about that for a moment. Think of how much you love the things of this world. Oh, I love my car. Oh, I love my family. My boat. Oh, I love my boat. Oh, I love golfing. Okay? Golfing and wisdom. Which would you choose? Oh, Father Jamie. <laughs> $100 million or wisdom? Father Jamie, why? 
I like the sentence that says, before her, but I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, before God, silver is to be counted mire. What is mire exactly? What is mire? Mire is a swampy, boggy ground. I had to look that up myself. <laughs> it's not every day I use the word mire. But that's an interesting thing. We have all sorts of words often in the scriptures that we don't see. So if we don't, if Father Jamie doesn't know it, how should Father Jamie expect other people in the pew to know, oh, that's what mire is? A swampy, boggy land. So, so read that, substituting those. Because all gold in the view of her is like sand. In fact, on the back of the book that, that I published last year on celebrations of stick, it shows me pouring a, a cup of sand. I was preaching on this Sunday's scriptures about how it is that what is gold worth? Gold is worth this, sand, in God's eyes. As human beings, we look at gold and we're like, oh, gold. We go chasing after it like it's the new shiny thing. But God, gold, sand, sand. Silver or a swampy, boggy marshland? Yeah, for God, they're both the same. But humans chase silver. Makes better rings than swamps. Does it? Well, like we're saying, it it's, uh, <coughs> leads towards God. And especially in the last, the last uh, three lines, it says, "Yet good things together come to me, come to me in her company, and countless riches, is, riches at her hand." Which means, to me, which means whatever you may have around you is not as rich as the wisdom of God in His hands that you're in His hands. So that's. How there you go. So maybe there's truth. We've told that story before here about the young couple sitting down to breakfast where he says to her, honey, one day we're going to be rich. She says back to him, honey, we are rich. Maybe one day we'll have money. There's a difference between having gold and silver and all sorts of things like that and being rich. Having all those things doesn't make you rich. It makes you wealthy. It doesn't necessarily make you rich. Having wisdom and prudence makes you rich. <clears throat> so we're supposed to pray for wisdom and, and I'm not arguing that but instead of the gold and the silver and the you know all the things we like what are we supposed to do with that once we pray for it and get that I mean that wisdom yeah thoughts go on uh, make good decisions um, treat people better yeah. become more like more godlike yeah. But then we have nothing. I won't have a new car. I won't have jewelry. <laughs> is, is, is that the case? Or will, there, will you somehow be blessed through those things? That is to say... <laughs> well, I, I just ask that it. you could have the riches in your car, but you also have the wisdom to spread to other people to be a good shepherd on spreading the wisdom of God and <clears> love <throat> and the spirit of God. That is the riches that we should feel instead of the riches of our vehicle, home, or whatever we have in our bank account. So would it be a 50-50 thing, or would it be a 75% wisdom, 25% materialistic things? Which I know materialistic things. Like we should, it's you almost know. like if the genie comes to you and says, I'll give you one wish, my wish would be, okay, then I get six more wishes or something like that. You know, they're like... The, the scenario here is this ancient mind thinking, like, if you can only get one or the other, Becky, you have to choose one or the other. I'm going to, I'm going to give you 50% wisdom and 50% riches. The story that we have of Solomon in the Gospels that God said to Solomon, oh, because you chose wisdom, I'll also give you the riches. Countless riches. <clears throat> Presuming almost that if you have the wisdom, if you're treating others right, <clears throat> etc., loving God, loving others, then God is going to take care of us even if we may not be multi-millionaires living on some island. We'll be rich in other ways. Vincent? There's a, everybody knows who Keanu Reeves is, right? Keanu Reeves, in one of his statements, uh, he was on live TV, and he said, many people think I'm rich. I am rich. I make movies, I get money, and this is not. Many people think I live the way I live, but I live on my riches of 
being humble and the wisdom of the riches that I have, I can help other people. And I thought that was something that was really good. There's something about that. I have a friend, Consuelo, who's a, who's a speaker. She, she likes to say, I'm the world's poorest millionaire, because even though people love her and you know give her all sorts of money to go and speak in places, she just gives it away. She says, give me a, a, a Coke and two taquitos and I'm happy. <laughs> I don't need lots of money. It sounds yeah. so crazy, but one of the, and I, the only other person that I talk to really about this is my grandmother, but ever since I've like given myself to Christ the way I have, I don't want for anything. I have everything I need. Um, and I don't get it twisted. I could use a million dollars, but right now I have everything I need. I've got food in my refrigerator. I've got gas in my tank. All my bills are paid. So, I mean, if, I don't know. It's, it's, and I try to tell my brother this too, like, you just gotta trust God and he's gonna make sure. And it sounds so crazy, but I'm really like, I don't know, we're okay. If you really think about it, you're okay if you, I don't know how to explain that. Yeah. Trust God. Maybe that's a good segue into the gospel <coughs> on Sunday. I know we didn't get to the third question, what is God calling us to, but maybe we'll come back to that in the end. In the meantime, in the gospel on Sunday, we have the story of a young man who comes and thinks that he's doing God's will and then he's challenged to trust in God. Okay, you, if you trust in God, you believe in God, go sell everything you have, and then come back to me. What does he do? Do we read the gospel? Would you like to read the gospel or divide it into two parts? Stephen, you read the first, Jordan the second? As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up knelt down before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Let's just pause, make sure we're setting up the story. We all understand who the two main characters in the story are? Jesus, Jesus and the man. a man who's running up to him. The man asked, is asking Jesus, what do I have to do to get into heaven? Stephen? Jesus answered him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandment. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and father. He replied and said to him, Teacher, of all these things I have observed from my youth. Jesus said, Jesus looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You are lacking one thing. Go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. <clears throat> then come follow me. Then come follow me. At this statement, his face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. We'll, we'll stop right there. So here is a man who comes and wants to follow Jesus. What do I have to do to get into heaven? Well, Jesus says, you've read the commandments. We're all familiar with the Ten Commandments. You've read the 613 commandments, actually, but he's referring to verse 10. You've read the commandments. What did I tell you to do? Right? I tell you to not kill anyone, etc. cetera. And he says, well, I've done all those things, okay? You really want to follow Jesus? Sell everything you have? And come follow me. Be like Peter and my other friends here who gave up everything that they had. They left their boats and their nets and they came and followed me. Is it, to me in my mind, I'm, it's more than just sell your stuff and follow me. Sell your stuff, help the poor, then follow me, right? Oh, so it's not just selling, it's not just me selling all my stuff and giving it to my parents or my people who I love. It's giving it to those who don't have. So that's a fascinating insight. Yikes. Because 1,200 years after Jesus, St. Francis of Assisi, remember the story that we told about how it was the St. Francis of Assisi had this idea that only 144,000 people were going to be saved. And so if he was going to be one of those 144,000, he had to do something like extra special. So when he read the Bible, he came across a passage, this one, and said, okay, I've tried to serve Jesus in all the other ways. If I'm going to get into heaven, I want to be one of these 144,000. I have to do something that all those old widows who are praying the rosary from morning till night are not doing, and that is sell everything I have and follow Jesus. So that's the one thing. It says you're lacking in one thing. Is it that he is not devoting his life to Jesus, but rather you know, accumulating all these things and having them in his possession? It seems so. The only reason that I hesitate to answer that is because for any of us, it leaves us asking, well, what, 
What is God calling me to do here? Is God calling me to sell everything that I have? I'm not encouraging anyone to take this literally in the way that St. Francis of Assisi did, but maybe there's some deeper lesson in all of this about how it is that, you know, short of selling everything that I have, what lesson might God be trying to tell me through this reading? Maybe about how it is that I need to be putting God first above all these other things that I have. Ooh, I really want a new this or that. Okay, that's great. Is that becoming your God? When your work or your hobbies or other things start to become your God or to, to replace God in your life? Like, how are you making God numero uno? I guess it's basically saying that none of these possessions mean, any, mean anything unless you have God in your heart. There you go. And I think one of the key phrases is throwing up riches in heaven, meaning, okay, congratulations on that new necklace, or give me an example, right? That new car, that new television set, that new set of golf clubs. Congratulations, I'm glad the Lord has blessed you in that way. They're not going to get you into heaven. Yikes. They could even be weighing you down, which brings to the second half, Jordan, of the gospel, <coughs> about things that weigh us down. Jordan, you want to pick it up there? <clears throat> Jesus looked around and said to his <coughs> disciples, how hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. So Jesus again said to them in reply, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said among themselves, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For human beings it is impossible, but not for God. All things are possible for God. We'll pause right there. So, so then now that we're thinking about people who are burdened by their possessions, congratulations on your new yacht or your new television set or your new home or whatever it is, your new set of titanium golf clubs. I tend to be on golf analogies here for some reason. Congratulations, but it is as easy for a rich person to get into heaven as it is to get a camel. Okay, now Jesus is famous for using hyperbole, exaggeration. It's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle. Okay, ladies probably know better than men. How, how big is it, the eye of a needle? We've, we've tried to thread a needle. Imagine in Jesus' day, the needles probably were something similar, where needles weren't that, needles were not big enough for a camel just to step through. So for Jesus to come up with this hyperbole, this exaggeration, and say, okay, it's easier to get that big old camel through the eye of that needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. Scripture scholars have puzzled for 2,000 years. How do we understand these words? Because obviously that's a big exaggeration. We're talking about a camel in the eye of a needle. They've wondered, for instance, was there a, a gate or a door leading into the city of Jerusalem that was like maybe named the, the eye of the needle? It's easier to get a camel through that little door. Think of a camel all loaded up with all sorts of things on it. It's easier to get a camel through that door, the eye of the needle door. The only challenge is that archaeologists haven't found a door that was called that. You know, what was Jesus trying to say? Part of it is, when you start being burdened down with all sorts of possessions, suddenly your eyes are no longer on God. Your eyes become on whatever those things are. We think more about those things than about God. It, tying back to the first reading, which one are you going to choose? Wisdom or these other possessions? Jesus, which are you going to choose? All these things that you have, that are distracting you from God and God's kingdom, or are you going to focus on God, following God in whatever state in life you find yourself? I'm not asking you to give up your, your husband or wife or kids or home or car, but to what extent do things distract you? Think of some of our technologies, things like phones, right? How much screen time do we spend? Do the, are those things helping us to grow in our relationships with God and or in what ways might they be? They can. Obstacles. They can. They can connect us with others. It's beautiful being able to connect with others through Facebook, and, you know, and have a relationship with them in, in <coughs> certain ways. In what in what ways do things like technology? Since this week we're celebrating, um, Marcel, uh, 
we talked about the, the effects of, of technology. Is that technology helping you grow in relations with God, or is it getting in the way? Mario? But Father, in our country, here in the United States, a lot of it justified that we give by taxes. Uh, there's an income tax, there's a sales tax, there's all kinds of taxes, property taxes, everything to help the people that need help. Some of us get frustrated because uh, those people are not really trying to help themselves. They spend it on something else. And uh, I'm not saying everybody. We're not talking about everybody. But some will uh, become dependent. If we give everything, then we're the poor. We're going to be homeless. Uh, it's a it's a very difficult situation, but this country has helped people. Uh, I'm I'm not saying everybody's getting help, but we're supposed to. We're supposed to help others. Uh, at one time, it was the church. Uh, study history and all of that. The church would help the people because they knew who needed it and who was faking it. But then the government took over and said, we're going to do it. But a lot of people are not telling the truth and they are abusing our taxes. That's been a dilemma in our country and I'm sure in others other countries, they, they just steal everything. Uh, people steal because they they, they don't want to give because or they find a way around not giving. Uh, it's, it's, it's a major problem for us as an American person. That's a tremendous question for us. How much do we give of what we have to help others? Because we have this idea that what I have is mine. This is my money. You have your money, I have my money. If you don't want to work for money, that's your problem. I'm going to keep my money for me. Those, the church. That, those that work for it, but the ones that did not, they just inherited sometimes. They, if, they, if you don't work for it, you might throw it away. Uh, Jordan? There's something called the giving pledge where the wealthiest citizens are donating all, most or all of their wealth during their lifetime. So is that kind of similar? Oh, I like that analogy. So the giving pledge, I'm Bill Gates and I have all sorts of billions of dollars. I have pledged that instead of passing it on to whomever after my life, I'm going to find some way for it to help people while I'm alive. <coughs> There's something, there's something very insightful about that fitting with this gospel of Jesus saying, give away all that you have. Imagine for any of us in this room to have a giving pledge. What would that look like? We, we recognize none of us in this room, none of us watching this, none of us taking anything with us when we die. What's going to happen with all these things that we're accumulating? Well, how will it help others? That's a good, that's a good connection. I, I looked up what does it mean in the Bible. It says the eye of a needle. It says the eye of the needle is in fact not only narrow, but only tall enough for a human to get through. Thus, a camel would not only have to unload the baggage, but come through the gate on its knees. Thus, in order for a rich man to be saved, not only must he unload his possessions, but he must also kneel before God. So that's one interpretation. That's yeah. a lovely interpretation. So that's the challenge. I, I preached a similar interpretation for many years about a gate called the, the eye of the needle. The challenge is that I, I can't I can't prove that there's a, a gate called that. But I, I like that interpretation. Yeah. There's something about you know the camel having to get down on his knees and unload to come through the door and unload everything. Oh, there's something very beautiful about that image. That's a very visual image that that sticks with us. Do I have to get rid of my car? 
<laughs> well, question, do I have to get rid of my car? Do I have to get rid of my phone? Do I have to get rid of my golf clubs? Do I have to get rid of my yacht? Do I have to get rid of my home? The question would be, are those things distracting you? Where, where, where are you in choosing things over God or God over things? If you're choosing God and those things are serving that purpose, then that's probably one thing. If you're choosing things and those things are becoming a burden for you getting into heaven, you might want to be careful. You're going to find yourself outside the gate, burdened like a camel. Jordan, you want to bring us home to this gospel? <clears throat> Peter began to say to him, We have given up everything and followed you. Jesus said, Amen, I say to you. There is no one who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now in this present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. I think that's a big risk. Jesus is saying, do you trust enough that you're willing to give these up, believing that you'll go back a hundredfold? How's that for sacrifice? Think of our own generosity. I appreciate Mario's words about generosity, right? right? How much do I give? Am I willing to trust that if I give this little bit or this lot, whatever I'm giving, that it's not me having any less at the end of the day, that somehow the Lord is going to work through that and bless me. We don't tend to think like that. We tend to think of through a more scarcity, through a scarcity lens or mindset. Well, if I give $5, then I have $5 less. Rather than if I give $5, I'll get back 100 fold. I'll get back $500 in value from the $5 that I gave. I dig it. Do I trust that God's going to bless me? 500 times, $500 over for the $5 I get, 100 times, I'm going to get 100 times the blessing back. So maybe that helps to lead us, and as Vincent, I'll come to you in a moment, but maybe that leads us to these two questions. What is God calling us to through words like this? When Luke wrote these words, he was obviously trying to challenge his readers. What was he hoping that God might be calling them to, Vincent? What in this whole thing about giving up everything? In what time? How, how can I ask the question? I'm just gonna say, it. go ahead. Someone in their 30s, someone in their 50s, someone in their deathbed. Uh -huh. When is the right time to give up your riches? Is it when you're 30 and you're became a millionaire? Is it when you're 50 and you did something and you became, you have all this money, all this cars or whatever? Or is it at your deathbed when it's time you realize, I don't need all this stuff. I need God so I can go into his kingdom. So when <clears throat> is it appropriate for wisdom? to accept wisdom, God's wisdom, instead of the riches that you have. Any thoughts on that? I don't know. I, don't know. I, I think that's where, where wisdom comes in, you know? How do, we, how do we pray for wisdom that we might know what it is that we're to do in the, in the time that we're supposed to do it? God, with, give me wisdom. I think with this, it sounds like he's almost taking it literal. And one thing that I'm trying to learn now in Bible study is not to take the Bible so literal. Um, so when so I read it, it, so what is God calling you to as a result of these words then? To put God first before everything else. Okay. I think that's a good concrete lesson to take away. Are you putting God first? If so, you're storing up treasures in heaven. Joe? There's not a time like that. It's, a, it's, it's how you live all the time. In other words, you, you don't say, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, it's what you're doing every day. So maybe it's not just one act of giving one day, but it's something, it's how we live, we live our lives over time. God is calling us to think about our generosity in that way. It's not just about me giving $5 on any day. 
about how I'm living my life. You might not live for the next day. <clears throat> might not live till, till that opportunity of giving it all away. It's going to be left to the state of Texas. Okay? Mario? It's not just money. It's act. You take action and help somebody. Like the other day, I was over there at Sam's, and my 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 wife bought a huge uh, a dog food. Man, that thing was heavy, huh? and she put it on a on a, a cart. Huh? I was having trouble getting it out of the cart, and this father told his son, "Get out." and go and help that man. And that young man came over and he said, I'll get it for you, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. And, and I said, where did this come from? You know, I mean, yeah. in my mind, I was thinking, that's an act of God. Yeah. And we helped him. There you go. They picked it up, put it in the, in the SUV. Yeah. And, There's something about that. Thank you, man. Thank As a church, we, we say it's not always about money. As a church, we always talk about the three T's, time, talents, and treasure. Anything that we have, anything that I have does not belong to me. How can I share it? Okay, I'm a young man. I have strength. Someone else needs my strength. I'm called to share my strength with someone else. Oh, okay, I have time or I have a car. Okay, I'm, this is not my time, my car. How do I share my time and my car with someone who needs my time and or my car? Oh. My talents, I know how to sew. I don't know how to sew. But imagine I knew how to sew or how to cook. Okay, how am I sharing those talents with other people? That was very nice. The second reading from the letter to the Hebrews is a very brief reading. Anyone itching to proclaim the second reading, the letter to the Hebrews? Brothers and sisters, indeed the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even, be even between souls and spirit, joints and marrow, and able to discern reflections and thoughts of the heart. Can we just stop right there? I hate to interrupt you during such a short reading, but I want us to focus on that word sword, because the word sword, makairon in Greek, Actually, we wouldn't translate a sword like a big sword, like we're going out into battle, but it's more like a smaller dagger, like a person like Peter would have carried. When Peter cut off the, the serpent's ear in Gethsemane, he was carrying a machiron. It wasn't a big old sword. It was more like what he as a fisherman would have used to cut, op cut open the fish. So it was more like a dagger, you might think. Okay, so think about what, so instead of thinking a sword, like I'm gonna cut a person in two, Think meat daggers, or think, uh, what do we call them now? Meat cutting knives? Like a filleting knife? Or any kind of knife that a, you know, a person who works in meat cutting would use? What does that knife do? You know, we use it to cut away the, the meat from the fat, or from the ligaments, or from the bones, or whatever other thing. That's how the Word of God is. God's Word is going to cut certain things away from other things. So really, that sets us up for the second half of the reading. No creature is concealed from him, but everything is naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must render an account. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what is sharper than a two-edged sword or dagger? The word of God. The word of God is going to, is going to help to cut things apart at the end of time. Is going to expose things. We're going to use the word naked. Naked, is that in scriptures? Right. How it is that it's going to expose things. When you cut certain things away, cut away the fat and the meat is exposed. That's how the word of God is. The word of God is going to expose things. One of the things it's going to expose is what's in your heart. Imagine the, the word of God cutting away everything and leaving you naked, not physically, but exposed like before God. All of these riches and everything, you know, think of 
you know, all the work that we spend on our clothing and making ourselves up and everything, all of our jewelry, everything like that. Yeah, God's work, God's going to cut away all that at the end of time. It's just going to be you standing, not naked physically, but exposed in front of God with all the riches and everything else cut away. Who are you then? Yikes. So, so God is giving us an algorithm, <clears throat> a process, a way to get to heaven. I like that. It's probably not as precise as an algorithm, but I like that. It's sort of like a recipe, a formula, some yeah. ideas on, I like that. Step by step. Sometimes when we get older, then that when we, <laughs> you know, we start thinking about it. I like the idea of an algorithm. I, I wouldn't have thought of that myself. So he was saying that the second reading is like an algorithm? The, because the, to me, I kind of general. looked at the first reading kind of almost like um, a how-to. How there you go. A how-to. I think that's what the scriptures, what the word of God is. Anything that God might be calling you to for the second reading from the letter to the, the Hebrews? As you look at your life, Stephen? Cut everything out of your life that that and focus on God. There you go. Maybe. And each one of us has to answer answer that question for ourselves. That is say, what's Stephen's answer is Stephen's answer. We have to think about that for ourselves. What I'm hearing is that for Stephen, it might be okay. How do I look into my life and cut away those things that are distracting me or, you know, making me go in other directions? Steve Vincent? I understand what you're saying about focusing on God and everything. And honestly, on August the 3rd, when they told me I was going under a knife, and uh, I have a doctor that speaks forward to me and uh, he said when you wake up if I'm holding your hand I'm sorry if I'm not holding your hand we have optimistic so from here to then you need to think about where you're going and which way you want to go in those four days I prayed to God forgot about everything, my two jobs, I forgot about how I was going to pay for things, I forgot about everything else, but focus. Because when they tell you you're going to lose your foot, it hurts, it, it's overwhelming. And uh, this scripture today it hit home. It hit home. Cuts like a knife. Causing us to focus on what's most important. What is God calling me or us to? Maybe that's focusing on what's important. So, and this is just going back to earlier, we were saying she, 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 and the second reading, the end it says, to, of, in the eyes of him whom we must render an account. Are they talking about God right there? That is. So, probably on Sunday when we hear those words again, we'll probably be using either God's pronouns, but yeah, to the one. Who will have to render an account to the one who's going to judge us. The one who has the two edged dagger. He's going to slice away the various things that you thought were important. Yikes, what's going to be left? Hopefully, any of us will be able to stand there and say, Yeah, you can slice away my cell phone and my jewelry and my car and my home, and yeah, it'll be okay. Any final reflections on scriptures? As we hear all of these scriptures together, anything that these scriptures might be calling us to as Catholics, we tend to think not in terms of us as individuals, but as us as a community, anything that <coughs> might be calling us as a community to? Help the poor and follow God. Help the poor? Ways that we might be able to help the poor better than we are? I suspect that we could probably reflect on that and figure out, you know, the Lord has blessed us. When I read all sorts of stories of people trying to come to the United States, I think today I read a story of people like down in Colombia who are like trying to come to the United States, and I think to myself, that's kind of 
crazy. We live in a world where there are all those people who want to come here. Why is that? Oh, maybe because they're making two or four or six dollars a day when we're making whatever we made through active or passive income today, okay? You know, you can probably understand why people are trying to do that. What am I doing to help other people? They see us as the haves, and they're experiencing life as have-nots. Is there some justice that we can bring to the world where people enjoy means that are more close? In a world where there aren't poor people who are dying every day of hunger, and who feel so desperate that they're trying to travel all these miles to get to a place where we live. I, I also think that on wisdom is not necessarily just wisdom. I think is, I, you would have to. I would say you would have to add a little part two to that, a little quotation to that, saying that wisdom is also a blessing because even though you may want to share what you have with others, <coughs> sometimes you have to accept from others the hidden blessings that they give you and you don't know that that is a blessing. That's how I'm seeing things now. Sometimes I, sometimes I sit at home and I'm like, what do I, how, what have I done to deserve everybody's blessing and, and prayer? And I don't think I've given enough of, to give, even though I'm receiving a lot of blessings. I'm guessing wisdom allows us to see that, to see our blessings and how it is that we might be able to bless others. <coughs> some, some people have, in history, they have used religion to destroy somebody else. Uh, the Inquisition is an example. Um, and now, terrorists, I work my religion, only my religion. You cannot practice something else. Or it's against minority people, against women, Right now, there's a lot of things happening against women. Uh, some governments are passing laws anti-women for her not to make a decision or whatever. Uh, and some people can say, we're doing God's duty to hurt someone. There are religions that you cannot be if you're intermarried or if you're poor. <laughs> you can't go to that church, you know. Sure. Some of them that are very wealthy church, uh, they look at you like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. So uh, religion can be used against others in many, many ways to discriminate. That God is saying, don't you, I think he's saying, don't use religion to hurt people. You know, that could be one, one way that we, something that we take from that. Some people believe slavery was okay. Uh, it was, it's the Bible to justify it. It came from the Bible, they said. Stephen? What does it mean to number our days aright? Well, that's a question right there. It says, but and I usually read them. But what is, when you say number your days, that's usually some, like not a good thing. Number your days, like your days death is coming up. Thoughts right. on numbering our days aright? It seems like a translation is difficult for us. It seems like there are other ways that we might translate that into English. It seems that what the ancient author was trying, probably trying to tell us was, help us to have the wisdom to see our lives in the right perspective. You know, if 
Uh, let's go back to Vincent's example, since Vincent was so generous to offer that to us. If I knew that my life was going to change in some radical way in a matter of days or weeks or months, would I live my life differently? What would I do differently? And if so, why am I waiting to get that news from a doctor when I could be making that change in my life today? If, if a doctor told me suddenly that I'm diagnosed with, with X, then I'd go home to my husband or wife or my kids and tell them I love you in a different way than I currently am, then maybe I need to number my days and write and go home and tell them I love them like that, as if. Isn't there a, some sort of country song that was like, live as if I were dying or something? It's sort of like that. Uh, there's some, a certain wisdom in living as if we were dying. Because if we were all to step back and think about it just for a moment, the sad fact is, every day is a day closer to that event. Okay, when will I have the wisdom to live like I were dying? And to forgive that person, or to tell that person I love them, or I forgive them, or to ask their forgiveness. There's something about numbering our days and nights. By the way, it's the 100th anniversary that we let women vote in federal elections. The 100th uh, anniversary of allowing women to vote in, uh, even the language that you use, huh, of allowing women to vote in federal elections. I mean, there's just something about us reflecting on our sinful past <laughs> and asking what else do we need to change so that people in the future don't have to suffer from the things that people in the past have suffered from. Vincent? It's also one more thing I can reflect on. <clears throat> I just posted yesterday, I saw it and I posted it, I thought it, kind of like <clears throat> blew my mind a little bit, but it was just something so real that it takes six to eight people to lift you up and put you in pall barriers to put you in the ground to go up to heaven. Why wait until those six or seven people can lift you up at that time when you're alive now to lift up six others, to call six or seven people and just say, hello, how are you? That's profound. Don't wait until they're dead to lift them up. That's profound. You know, for the scriptures for Sunday, we're ready to transition to the rosary. For those who are joining us on Facebook, uh, we'll give some instructions on who's doing the rosary and which page we're on. Glorious Mysteries on page 46 of Father Roy's Rosary. On Facebook we have a link. I'm pulling back the camera so that it's focusing on whom? Well, uh, we're following Joe, Joe's cue as whoever, whoever does it, let's do it in a loud voice so that we make sure that we can hear in the room, but also all our friends on Facebook can hear us as well.
did good needed surgery or, uh, or he came out of it uh, and uh, a good friend of mine a golfing friend of mine uh, Joe Montoya who was diagnosed with uh, stomach cancer so um, many prayers for him Holy Mary, 
Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The angel said, Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen, he is not here. Tell Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Thus art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and is going before you to Galilee. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The women ran from the tomb with fear and great joy to tell the disciples. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Simon Peter ran to the tomb with the disciple Jesus loved. The other disciples saw and believed. Hail Mary, full of praise, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary Magdalene saw Jesus, but did not recognize him. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Where have you laid him? Jesus said to her, Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary Magdalene ran to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. That evening, Jesus appeared to his disciples and said, Peace be with thee. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those who have most need of thy mercy. The second glorious mystery is the ascension of the Lord into heaven. Jesus returned to God in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil amen jesus stood before his disciples and said to them peace they were strong and frightened thinking that they were seeing a ghost hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Jesus said, See my hands and my feet. It is me. Ghosts do not have flesh and bones as I do. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. He asked, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, which he ate. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord. Sorry. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. <clears throat> Then Jesus said, I spoke my words to you that everything written about me in the scriptures might be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds 
to understand the scriptures. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that forgiveness of sins should be preached to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Jesus appeared to his disciples for forty days, sharing with them, convincing evidence that he was alive, and speaking with them about God's kingdom. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. He told them, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Leading his disciples to Bethany, Jesus blessed them, and he was carried up into heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. They began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
Devout Jews from every nation were in Jerusalem. They were startled to hear the disciples speaking in different dialects. Hail Mary, full of praise, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Stunned and amazed, the people said, We hear this Galilean speaking in our own languages about the miracles that God has done. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Stir into the flame the gifts God has given you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. As good stewards of God's varied graces, use the gifts you have received to serve one another. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those who have most need of thy mercy. The fourth glorious mystery is the Assumption of Mary into heaven. At the end of her life on earth, Mary was assumed, body and soul, into heavenly glory. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark that you have made holy. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. God's temple in heaven was open, and the Ark of the Covenant could be seen in the temple. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. A great sign appeared in the sky. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. She gave birth to a son, destined to rule all nations with, a, with an iron rod, and her child was taken up to God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have salvation and power come, the kingdom of our God and the authority of God's anointed. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the woman was given the wings of a great eagle so that she could fly to her place. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The dragon became angry with the woman and waged war against her. Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those who have most need of thy mercy. The fifth glorious mystery, the coronation of Mary. Mary was crowned as queen of heaven and earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let the maiden who pleases the king be queen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. He set the crown upon her head and made her queen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The disciples were filled. The queen was brought before the king with a royal crown. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. He had a throne set for the king's mother, and she sat on his and she sat on his right. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. She is the king's daughter. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We have come down to greet the children of the king. 
and the children of the Queen Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Burn incense to the Queen of Heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. You are adorned with gold and silver, and your dress is of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, blessed art thou. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. You eat fine flour, honey, and oil. You are exceedingly beautiful and royal. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. She says in her heart, I sit as a queen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those who have most need of thy mercy. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O holy Mother of God. That we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. O God, whose only begotten Son, by his life, death, and resurrection, has purchased for us the rewards of eternal life, grant we beseech thee that by meditating upon these mysteries, most holy rosary of the blessed virgin mary we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through the same christ our lord amen, amen. may the divine assistance remain always with us amen. amen and may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of god rest in peace amen, amen. in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen, amen. amen. <coughs> Before we take a break, for those who are joining us on Facebook, <clears throat> we know that it is Terry's birthday, so we just want to wish her a happy birthday. For those joining us on Facebook, we'll be back in a few minutes.